Well, it's seven o'clock. Welcome to this uh, special edition of talks about the future. And this time, we're going to talk about the future in one particular field, but one of the most important in our lives. What competences will we all need to make the most of what the future brings? What will the new world require of us? How to understand it, uh, even how to understand it even before it knocks on our door? And the future is indeed around the corner. By the way, we actually saw a good part of it yesterday with the American launch of this space commercial mission with two astronauts set in orbit. I think personally that this direction, the cosmic direction up there, can have more influence on our future that, than many people may think today. So there's a good, very good reason to ask what competences will be crucial in the 21st century? What are they? How and where can you define them and develop them? These are the questions that need an answer or at least a good discussion. I'm joined today by Amy Steinman, Consul General of the United States in Poland. Hello. Who's Hello. with us? I, I must correct you. I'm the Public Affairs Officer at the US Consulate in Krakow. Good. That's even better. Thank you. Right. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, and you. you are in Krakow, in fact. Alison Daly, Wayne Community College, and she's with us from North Carolina. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Don Allen, director of English Touring Theatre Company in Krakow as well. Hello. Hello, and thank you. Anna Krzemińska Kaczynska, founder of World Link, World Link Foundation. Hello. Good evening from Poland. Thank you for having me. And Alina Deja Grygierczyk, founder and director of Polish uh, Academy of Canada, surprisingly joining us from Berlin. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hello. hello. Welcome nice to, to all of you. you. We're also, ladies and gentlemen, waiting for your comments and questions, which you can write and send to us and share with us, share with everyone, just under this broadcast that you're watching at the moment. Okay, so let's start. Oh, by the way, have you actually watched the event? Did you watch it yesterday? How 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 the rocket was sort of rising up. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. I just, yes. <laughs> I'm asking this. Perhaps it's a bit off the topic, but it was for me. It was so inspiring that I just wanted to 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 pop this question because I think it sort of wakes up this spirit of scientific exploration. That's very very useful for the topic that we're going to discuss today. Don't you think? Yeah. It John. was very exciting to watch it, and it, it's quite—it's uh, it, just—it's just fascinating, awe-inspiring, seeing these two people propelled into space and all the stuff that goes with it, and to get people there. So it, it was wonderful, and uh, you're a bit nervous just in case something does go wrong. <laughs> thank, thank goodness, nothing went wrong, and uh, they made it, which is great. Yeah, I saw a bit of a future there. So uh, perhaps. Navigating a rocket will be one of the competences that will be needed in the future, but there are a few others. And so let's try to let's try to discuss them. What do you think is today the most important competence or a set of competences that uh, we should look out for if we are students, if we think about education, if we think about our career paths in the future? Perhaps Anja Kseminska could start. Thank you so much. Um, I think that generally the rules for getting ahead have been changed. Uh, yesterday, definitely, that was a, a blast. And with our students, we were we were watching. They were even sending messages. Okay, please watch. Okay, what has happened? Yeah. We had a great honor also to uh, to visit um, NASA in Florida and see everything. Okay, how it goes and how the history has been done with the references mm -hmm. to uh, to launching. Um, into the orbit and being there. Um, when it comes to competence, okay, I think that yesterday we could see also, okay, what has been thought and also has been mentioned by a famous even philosopher, Alvin Toffler, mm. probably you know this one, that mm. elite of the 21st century um, will not be those who cannot read and write, but he said that those who cannot learn and mm. learn 
and relearn. Mm. So I think that to succeed today, we must be in a constant state of adaptation. So continually um, unlearning old rules and relearning re re new ones. Um, uh, so learning agility is the name of the game, I would say, you know, to move quickly and easily, to um, have the ability to think and to understand quickly. This is so important yeah. nowadays, right? I cannot imagine, okay, the change within the teamwork. Now, during the COVID-19 uh, disruption, you can see how important it is to trust and to rely to one another. Right. Okay, right? thank you. Alison, Alison, what, 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 what do you think? I, I, I would add to what Anna is saying that um, in addition to being able to understand, and students will have to, in order to be able to educate people, we will have to look forward and we will have to see what students will have to be able to do. And in order to be adaptable to that, we have to look forward to what they will do. And those are things are um, solving pro big problems that are complex and they're not just isolated into certain disciplines. So mm -hmm. for example, the COVID-19 problem or even you know going to the um rocket launching to space yeah. These are things that don't just take the sciences they take collaboration across borders you know understanding people from different cultures as well as knowing your content area so collaboration is going to be key yeah and but i know of course, it, it, of course it is. but i just wanted to make sure are we not teaching enough of it at the moment i mean uh, aren't we aware that it is so important, the multicultural collaboration, cooperation, and so on and so forth? Are we not enough on that path? Well, I think we give a lot of lip service to it, but I'm not sure that students actually get as many chances to apply it as are needed. And we know that they become leaders and they become confident and they they generate solutions when they can understand mm. the problem. Problems, but if they only look at things from their perspective or from the perspective of their teachers who may be teaching data yeah. information, then they cannot be as effective as if they are um, really engaging and understanding the problem from many different perspectives um, yeah. and, and consulting real credible sources. Sure. Yeah, credible sources is one of the key points in the modern world. Yes, we'll probably come back to that particular point during this debate, during this discussion. John, what do you think? What is, in your opinion, uh, the most important set of competences for the global students? I think uh, one very interesting um, article I read was that something like 85% of the jobs that will be available in 2030 still haven't been invented yet. So. Mm -hmm. People are, are working on, on things that are still yet to be invented and looking for jobs that are still not ready and we don't know what they're there to be done. So that's really interesting and it's kind of frightening as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on soft skills. Uh, I'm a great proponent for soft skills. So all, all of these jobs will need to be fulfilled and to be done, but at the core of it is the person. And I think it's, it's the person that we can still... Uh, tap into and teach and show and train and and highlight yeah, competences. It's, it, it, it's interesting what you're saying, but you of course you realize that artificial intelligence will uh, come into our lives very dynamically, and perhaps a an individual will be in a way, uh, well, eliminated sounds badly, but, uh, but 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 there will be a lot of redundant people. Basically, that's what they say. That's right. So, what are we going to do with our spare time then? <laughs> you know what? I have very interesting statistics. They're yeah. coming from UNESCO. Mm. And what happens? If you can see me, I apologize. I'm cutting out. Oh. <laughs> and me, sometimes I'm not able to hear all of you sometimes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that there is a very interesting um, a report from the UNESCO. And they are saying that by 2030, you know, we will have the lack of 69 million teachers. So even though we feel okay that there there is a possibility that um, you know artificial intelligence, okay, or um, um, technology as well, okay, mm -hmm. of course there will be bringing the change. But also, okay, we've got that um, you know that prediction. On the other hand, you know, with, with my students of IB geography, we discuss the sustainable development goals. So there are still 263 million uh, children that have no access to education mm. so can you see what is happening the gap okay between 
even the children, okay, and will grow. It's widening. Plus, okay, nowadays we are talking also about the quality of education, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, isn't that a disgrace that this gap, instead of get shrinking, is getting bigger and larger with all the equipment, with all the instruments that are available to 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 civilized societies? Yeah. I think, and this this virus has kind of highlighted that, hasn't it? With a lot of homeschooling going on, mm -hmm. you suddenly realise that some children they don't have mm -hmm. a laptop or even internet access, and that yeah. that's quite sad to to to, mm -hmm. to, to understand right at this moment in time. All right, uh, Amy. So you know, I can speak from from my experience as as a diplomat um, with regarding the skill set that I think is really vital in my field. But I think it also applies to um, careers in you know foreign relations and uh, within the the global realm. So really, to many many um, professions. So you know, as it's been mentioned before, um, this ability to understand different cultures, cross cultural communication is really really essential. So I think, and you know, if you if you kind of dig further into that um, within communication, I think the ability to um, to understand different languages, to be able to communicate in different language, I think will still be mm -hmm. incredibly important in the future, regardless of you know all the the new technologies and and Google Translate and AI coming onto the scene. I think there are some functions that you know machines will just never be able to replace. Mm -hmm. and that's particularly true in in diplomacy, where it's really about human connections and communication. So, you know, I think the skill sets that are extremely vital for today's youth are going to be communication, which is both verbal and mm. written communication. And then what goes along with that is public speaking. So I think, mm. you know, it's, it's a really critical skill that I think should be taught really even at, you know, the elementary grades. Um, but you do it very well in the United States. You actually teach children how to speak publicly very, very well. You can be a pattern for many other countries. Yes, I would agree with that. There, there's a big emphasis on, you know, students presenting uh, during class. Um, mm. We try to move away from just kind of a lecture format in universities where actually mm. the students are more involved and they're presenting um, and they get to exercise those public speaking skills. Yeah. All right. Alina uh, Deja Grigerczyk. Yeah, so what probably else does Berlin have Spanish? to say about that? Um, how, how about Berlin? How is that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, well, it's a kind of a broad question. Um, first of all, I have to tell you that I'm going to speak from my experience of taking, you know, like students to Canada. The first thing that I noticed is that though we have, you know, some teaching about leadership, let's say that leadership is a human exercise. Sometimes the kids, you know, when we take them to Canada, where they are really like getting the first hand experience, what human leadership is, and it's an exercise. This is not like a theory is that they are afraid. I mean, like they are not able to communicate. They are not able to ask questions. They are just silent sometimes. So I do agree with Anya. Why is that? Yeah. Um, I think that's the fear, first of all, and they are not able to create and to put into practice, create and kind of an environment for themselves and for the other people mm. to make themselves happy and the other people happy. And because I work with uh, some leaders from Canada um, and we do communicate all the time how to change that, I do agree with Anya. First of all, it's definitely adaptability, uh, it's flexibility, and how to adapt to leaders. I mean, like to the people that you want to lead or to the needs to the, of your followers. That's definitely yeah. given. Uh, however, I would also say that this is the thing that I noticed in Berlin right now because the schools are open here right mm. now. Uh, that the students are suffering from the lack of social contact. I mean, like, like the social distancing is not disconnecting. So I would definitely put uh, a lot of emphasis uh, also on the communication. Because for some people, I see that, you know, like online education, like, or even if we talk right now, that this is something virtual, right? And uh, they have to know that leadership, human leadership, either it's virtual or not, it's still leadership. Okay, so can I just talk, talk, you know, like start on that particular point because uh, leadership has been taught for a long, basically forever, by various schools in different countries, this way or another. What or should we change anything in particular 
in this process of learning or teaching how to become a good leader, how to become a leader for the future with all the challenges that the future brings? Any, anybody, we can just sort of ex exchange. Our say that, uh, it's still a mystery. I had a talk yesterday with Bobby, with one of my advisors, and he said that in Canada right now it's a mystery. They have no idea what they're going to do, but what they're going to focus right now is that they're going to really focus on adaptability and how to adapt the changes. So how to prepare the students to have a different life. Because the thing that when it comes to, for example, I don't know, like schools mm -hmm. or business, you know, the students are working also all the time. Yeah. They have their online class and they work fully. So mm -hmm. they go to grocery. That's a kind of a, that was news for me. They go to groceries and they have their online classes. So, you know, business survived. It's not the first time that, you know, business people, they have to reinvent yeah. themselves. In fact, we had streaming, you know, video worlds. They, you know, we have no longer the, the, the place where we can borrow DVDs. We have internet. So business will survive. We have to reinvent themselves. Okay. All right. All right. So, so we, we've got relearning. That's what Anya Kshaminska said before. We've got a lot of you saying adaptability is important. We've got this um, uh, skill or competence of complex problem solving, so sort of cross uh, branch thinking. And we've got an emphasis on cooperation, especially in global in global terms. Mm -hmm. So we, we've identified the, the skills, unless you would like to add something to, to, to the list. Anya, I, I can see you nodding. You probably want to say something more on that. Because um, the thing is that we have forgotten, you know, about being a critical thinker. This is so important. And we are going to um, uh, organize our seminar on the 20th of uh, June, where actually, actually Miss uh, Alison Daly will be talking about uh, the fake news. Okay, how critically also, okay, read and go through the the um, um, the articles, etc. Okay, um, about the the world okay, that is happening around yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. One thing. I also teach uh, IB students, as I mentioned. Okay, they do have so-called IB learner profile, and over there, um, it's so important to be inquisitive, to be knowledgeable as well. Okay, and to be a critical thinker. I think. The good yeah. leader must be aware and must have a, um, a very, very high level of emotional intelligence. This is what we mm. cannot get nowadays. We can see, okay, how difficult it is okay, with the students and also with us, you know, adults. Is it, is it at all possible to teach emotional intelligence, in your opinion? Um, well, I, we can provide opportunities for students. Mm to um, exercise it. I mean, if we stay in isolation, we don't learn it as much well as if we get our students in situations where they have to identify needs in a community or in the world and then work to meet those needs. So if we, um, if we provide those opportunities and we mentor them along the way, they often do pick up those skills. And so that's why there are things like leadership programs that last you know, a year or two. Or, um, you know, sometimes capstone projects where students have to work through a process they, and, and then they present at the end what their findings are. And often yeah. those findings are things that are both about the problem, but they're also mm -hmm. about self-discovery. That's right. So if I may add something, when we take uh, students to Canada, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge for them. And uh, they really have to adapt to a lot of institutions and uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. So what we do, we uh, make them write journals and they always have to work on their personal awareness and how they developed. And then they have to, you know, think about the facts uh, about their life and uh, about their uh, like experiences. They have to look back at that comment. Is that the, leader, is that the leadership program you were talking about? Yeah, it's also, I mean, like in Canada, I don't know what about the United States. I'm not an expert here, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of schools, and that would be my dream to have it in Poland, and uh, that they have leadership courses. Mm -hmm. So oh, there are leadership oh, yeah. teachers, and they do analyze every week. They have like three or four times, you know, a gathering or meeting. They have a leadership uh, mm -hmm. teacher, and they do analyze what they did. They analyze, uh, well, what they did at home, what they did at school, how about the communication with their uh, friends. And they do a lot of, they call it like uh, self-reflection and working on their personal awareness and deep breathing. This is what they work on. Mm -hmm. 
And it's great because I, as the business person, I do it too. So I wake up at mm -hmm. four or five, I write my own journal and it helps me to develop myself. All right. Myself. Okay. I'd like to come back just for a moment. Uh, Anya said about fact checking as an important skill, mm -hmm. honestly, crucial skill. And perhaps that's also a question to, to Amy. Uh, you just mentioned a few points on how diplomacy changed and how the skills that are required for diplomacy uh, are changing. And that is, in fact, true in the in the post WikiLeaks uh, diplomacy, where we have uh, a wave, great wave of fake news, where we have organized misinformation campaigns. Uh, it's a bit of a different diplomacy today than it used to be 20, 30 years ago, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the diplomacy of the past was really between nation states, just, you know, official government interactions with other official governments. And now, um, you know, thanks to the um, all the advances of technology, we have stories and media coming in from lots of different sources, citizen journalism, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. And I mean, overall, I think this is a positive development, but it's also come with some potentially, neg you know, very dangerous and, and negative side effects. And that's the spread of false information, false narratives, propaganda, disinformation. So exactly. I think it's really critical that we teach our youth from a very young age how to think critically, as Anya said. Um, you know, media literacy is becoming an increasingly important component of, of education. Mm -hmm. um, and I think along with that, it's encouraging students to discover a variety of information sources. So, you know, where do you get your information from? Um, you have to look broadly. You have to be responsible sometimes for fact checking, right? Because we can't necessarily rely on the big media giants to do it for us. I'm not sure whether it's being uh, systematically taught in all countries now. Maybe you will tell me because you're experts on that, but are students taught how to distinguish between facts and uh, uh, and lies, frankly speaking, or not? Or is it still uh, besides the uh, major path, educational path at school? Uh, it's a major part of my curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, we have to teach students to differentiate between sources, whether they are scholarly or popular, mm -hmm. and then put them up on a test, for, you know, how you know, how authoritative is this author? Um, where is this published? Is it published for an audience of general readers or is it mm. published by published scholars? Yeah. And um, students have to, uh, they are often surprised by what they find because so many websites look legitimate. Um, and then they may have a, you know, they may be soliciting, you know, are there advertisements? Is it bright and shiny and, and trying to get your attention? Does it have clickbait on it? Um, and those kinds of questions uh, open up that discussion, but they still have to dig. And often, you know, students like shortcuts, so yeah. they want to find something that's quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the challenge. Right. Okay. Let me just quote a few a uh, few comments from our viewers. Uh, Katarzyna Wajuk says, we should show students that cooperation works better than competition. Quite a, quite, quite, quite mm -hmm. a good remark. Uh, especially after a long period of thriving capitalism. Uh, another uh, another comment from uh, uh, Yemda Simsek, as technology develops, as uh, Agnan said, the digital field is taking the place of human communication and this affects the self-confidence of young people. That's interesting. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed the, the, the what we what I have just read that it sort of undermines the confidence of young people? Don, you're running a, a, a you're running a, a theater company, and lots of young people come to you, don't they? Yeah, and I think I have noticed that we also do workshops in schools where we mm. we build on um, uh, students' confidence and building their confidence yeah. and covering presentation skills, etc. And sometimes having a person, having a young person stand up in the classroom and um, talk to the rest of their, their peers is really quite a challenge for an awful lot of students because we are so insular and so used to looking down at our screen and connecting with our screen all the time rather than mm. having our head up and connecting and hearing what's going on in the world. Yeah. So I think that is a challenge, uh, Greg, yes. Okay, Marta, would anybody else like to comment on that particular thing? 
Um, if I may, um, I have that experience that students, you know, need to have an experience. As uh, uh, Amy said, whenever I go to the United States, our students have an opportunity to be on stage, you know, to even have little social talks whenever even they go to the shop, etc. So that is so important, okay, to talk face to face, to understand, okay, that the interaction is very, very important. Mm -hmm. To express yourself is very important. Mm -hmm. We have to learn those techniques. And when I went to the United States for the first time, mm -hmm. and when I saw those little classrooms with a little stage, I was really, really impressed. So this is what we have to learn. Um, technology is needed, of course. They are much faster than we are. Each generation can even help us. And I can see, mm -hmm. you know, my experience right. that they're really, really quick and they are really, really yep. handy as well. So that is that is uh, uh, that is good. Uh, but um, um, I'm trying to use also technology, for example, since the, um, the lockdown started, we organized the mindful student, um, a mindful life meeting. So about global education, I'm a great, a lot of global education. Yep. And um, what we uh, did, we invited over uh, great speakers, you know, trainers, etc., to have the workshop delivered um, uh, to, to my students. And, um, you know, there is a problem whether you are going to have your camera on or not. So mm -hmm. after a very short period of time, the students were saying, we would like to see the faces, okay? We are missing yeah. them, okay? Yeah. So you can talk on the phone, but still, still, okay, you can feel the difference whether you are going to have the face sign or you are going to just use a regular um, yeah. you know, goal. So, that, so that, is, that is definitely the, the challenge. Um, I would like to, if I may, go back to um, leadership because you have asked about the leadership, okay? And um, Ian Tyson was also an honorable guest in my school from, uh, from Canada. And he told the students, okay, if you want to be the leaders, because this is what my students were asking them, okay, how to be the leader in this lockdown. And he said something very important. If you want to be the leader, just turn the camera on, be visible. Mm -hmm invite other students as well to be fair towards the teacher who is on the other side who could right. classes try to interact okay so we can do little things mm -hmm. and that really are going to make a big difference so that is so important mm -hmm. may okay. i ask some uh, all of you sure. something um uh yesterday i talked with bobby with my second advisor and he told me that the first thing that they're going to do uh, at their school is that they're going to slow down with education it is going to slow down. So he said that sometimes it's very good just to interact. So that's the thing that I noticed when I take students to Canada, that yeah. European students, for example, Polish students, they are so highly educated and the focus on the, on the knowledge, you know, like mm -hmm. hard skills, you know, and learning, learning, learning. And this is what I am mentioned, right? That yeah. they're not able to talk with people. They're not able to interact. Mm -hmm. So on the other hand, Canadians, they say like, wow, the students are so educated. We are less educated, you know, than the Polish students. So what the Polish students learn is like leadership, you know, and all the things that Anya mentioned, and they're impressed with our skills. So what I would suggest, I, I don't know if this is possible, mm. but we'll be able to slow down sometimes with education. Right? Yeah, well, just you, 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 you are experts. You tell me how to find an equilibrium in that, you know? You can just Google everything. A bit of Canada to Poland and to export a bit of Poland to Canada. Well, it's it's not so easy. <laughs> Anja Krzemiska has got an idea, I can see that. I, that. I believe that education is um, 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 interaction and also building the relation, okay? So, um, as I mentioned, I be um uh, curriculum is quite demanding students really really need to put a lot of effort okay to have that effectiveness in testing as you said mm -hmm. but also testing and having a test society comes from like 18th century okay if we're going Should to be abandoned right so we, oh that, mm -hmm. that's another story right okay <laughs> what the teachers did okay during online learning okay some mm -hmm. people okay were no way, I'm not going to test the, 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 the students, right? Look what IB board did, okay? They canceled actually the, um, uh, the final diploma exams, okay? To, because they felt that now, okay, we need to support actually the students, right? Okay. This is what we need. So that's a different story. But um, 
Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, can, I, can, can, can I just add to whatever you said? Because I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Arkana Badwai Mishra, technology, saying that technology is changing the face of communication. Uh, it is creating a gap between generations and teachers will need to learn this new kind of communication in order to reach out to students. Do you think that teachers are not well prepared for teaching uh, students the new 21st century skills? Well, Anna received a, uh, multiple responses from teachers and educators around the world asking about COVID-19. And one of the funniest ones that I read was from a principal in India who said that COVID-19 has done what principals all over the world could not do, make teachers more confident with technology. <laughs> so I think that it has been a challenge to transition from seated classes to online learning. Um, but you know, when you, when there's a crisis and you have to do it, you get better. We, we may not be there all the way yet, but we have, um, we have improved, I think. Um, we can't negate that as, as Dawn said, that there are some students that we have to be concerned about that they may not have the technology to participate. So new challenges arise. Um, but we do, we have made progress in a short place of time. Can I chime in? Of yes. course, of course. <laughs> so in, in, my, um, in my line of work, you know, part of my objective is to share American culture with Polish audiences. And we do that, you know, usually through a variety of programs face to face. You know, we bring American musicians here to perform. We have American experts who come here and, and give lectures. So the, you know, COVID has really kind of forced us to think creatively about how we can continue to engage with our audiences um, remotely and online. So we've been doing a lot with Zoom, um, a lot with online technology. Um, and it's, you know, it's been beneficial in the sense that we, we can reach more people than we have in the past, right? That's, that's the beauty of technology. You can be broadcasting to thousands okay. of homes. But the real challenge is how do you make that interaction as meaningful as it is in person? And I think that's something that we're still, you know, working on and trying to find ways to really, you know, how do you really connect with somebody through a screen? So I think this is one of the challenges that will um, come, you know, that will confront all of us as we look to really adapt more technology and incorporate that into our communication. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I haven't. I mean, yeah, Anya. Yeah, because, you know, I have an impression that we also have to unlearn the technology that we use and follow a new trend, okay, and see what our students are using, uh, how they are reacting into it. Um, what I also, you know, recently did with my students, we just sign up for the global lesson and we could participate, okay, with our IB geography students in a very nice field work. Um, so that was really amazing experience. We can use it also in geography. Whenever we start uh, the lesson, I give, you know, um, uh, different examples of, to the students. Uh, for example, um, let me think, um, oh, we were um, um, sightseeing and going to see the, um, uh, the wall in China virtually of course okay so this is a great opportunity for us of course there are threats okay um oh i'm so pleased that um uh, i have an opportunity to take part in the summit international summit in Pompanovich high school florida so thank you very much uh, mr hudson thomas for for having me and my group over there and there are experts um coming from microsoft and what they are also saying that technology okay connected with vr uh, is also not quite uh, friendly, let's put it this way, okay, for the students below 14. So, so that is a challenging one, okay, how to create also the good policy that our children and students are safe, you know, because yeah. we just yeah. enjoy, we can have fun, but also we have to think about that. Um, do, you, do, you think, do you think our respective countries, the United States, uh, Canada, Poland, is it, is there enough done about it by, by the governments and by, by the institutions responsible for it, for the young people to feel safe and then give them a chance to, to, to thrive in it, to use this uh, uh, new technology? Amy, perhaps? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, in the U.S. We have a very unique system because you know we have the federal government, and then of course you have state and local governments mm. that kind of govern um, education differently. Um, I think that technology is becoming a much greater part of the classroom in, in general. My hope is that you know one day every child in the U.S. has their their own iPad, um, and not only the the actual tool to be able to connect uh, and utilize this technology, but I think that you know, the government, be it federal or state or local, should yeah. also take responsibility for teaching us safe practices online. And that yeah. gets back to what we were saying before about the identifying misinformation, but also, you know, just being a, a savvy internet user and, and protecting yourself from, you know, predators or, or those who might try to harm you. So it's, um, you know, it's a complicated um, issue, but I, I still believe yeah. overall that yeah. I'm asking. I'm asking this question because obviously educational systems are, are tailored, are thought up by, by by governments, and by at the end of the day by by politicians. That's why I'm asking, uh, um, Anya. Yes, you, from yeah. the Polish perspective, you know, I think that there is a growing gap because um, um, I have an honor to to work with, uh, with Principal <clears throat> Valigura, who is always pushing us okay, to the higher standards. He has made actually also us okay, to to work really coherently, and the, mm -hmm. the feedback as well on um, online learning is very very positive. But mm -hmm. for example, you know, I'm not quite pleased with the fact that we can open the Zoom and just click and, and see each other. Okay, yeah. for me, it's not enough. So um, what I can feel, okay, that we really really need e-learning platform. We use mm -hmm. from, from time to time, for example, the platform like uh, like a Moodle platform. But uh, I know that in America, you've got impressive Blackboard Learn. This is a virtual learning uh, environment and also learning um, management system, right? Uh, you, you got it and it works really, really well. So I would suggest and really, really appeal to, you know, kind of politicians as well. Mm -hmm. that it is not enough. It is not enough that the kid has a laptop, okay? Mm -hmm. Someone has to guide the kid. Someone has to teach how to do it. Even though, you know, on the opposite side, you know that there are um, uh, examples of great um, self-technology um, uh, development, okay, like one laptop per, ch per child, a very, very famous world uh, project, when the kids, okay, of, um, um, of having no, actually, uh, technology, being not yeah. technologically equipped, they were able to discover everything by themselves, okay, on the laptops and be successful. But still, yep. I believe okay that a coherent strategy and mm -hmm. management strategy for IT and IT at schools okay are really required. And it, parents will have to be partners with that too, because so many of it, so much of the time now, this learning is happening at home. So uh, you know, enclosed spaces like Moodle or Blackboard allow teachers to put everything in one place, and they can deposit um, you know resources there that parents could trust yeah that's another that's another question which i th think is quite important how to make adults <laughs> more sensitive to what their children might need in the future that's another st story and perhaps <laughs> and, uh, Alison, you 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 you're laughing at it but it's, 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 it's my children i you know i had no idea what they knew how to do when they were teenagers and um you know i just was really not equipped and i think so many of us are not because our our generation didn't have all mm. these in our pocket and um and our children do so uh these are you know how do we uh, we, we have a question uh, we've got a, a sort of comment which disappeared instantly. Yes, it did, just as I was reading it. Well, not, yeah, well, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You can place it there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Any other? Any other? Oh, I think uh, Olga uh, is writing. I think it is of particular significance to emphasize the importance of developing the writing skills of global students. Could you express some ideas about this, ladies and gentlemen? Could you please? Yeah, I'd be yes, happy well, to... we... uh, Go ahead, Don. Okay, Amy no, we... first and Don. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, in my initial remarks, I mentioned the importance of, of communication, both verbal communication and, and written. So even as we move into the digital realm, um, written communication is still extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I think writing, you know, we need to teach our students how to write clearly, persuasively, factually. These are all very important skills um, that I think, you know, and that is absolutely something that cannot be replaced by, by AI or, or robots. Um, so I think, again, it's important to emphasize that early on in education and especially at the college level. Um, I'm probably Allison can speak to some of the um, introduction writing courses that are, are required for, for most um, university students. So I hope that that emphasis continues. All right, thank you very much, Don. No, I, yeah, I'd just like to add, uh, add uh, to what Amy has said, because I think also in this day and age, it's predictive texting, isn't it? That uh, we don't need to finish off the words and we use two letters to describe one word or something. So we're not even seeing the flow in a thought process for a person mm. to actually write and communicate their idea within a writing capacity. And I think, yeah, it, it's really important, again, coming down to, to writing and structure. Right, we are. Uh... We're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. I just just wanted to ask you a very general question. When you when you think about the future, when you think about your students, about what they know, what kind of skills they possess at the moment, and what they need for the future, are you optimistic or not so much? Always optimistic. <laughs> they come with such energy and joy, and when they are learning and they feel it's authentic. Uh, it's a pleasure to watch them grow. It's mainly our job to mentor them along the pathway and present challenges that are are real and um, ask them to grow. And then it's fun to watch them do it. Yeah, I definitely agree with Allison. I mean, like, honestly, I'm happy. COVID-19 only offered new opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say, of course, we need to human up, but... Um, I, I could say that um, they will have the ability to learn something new, to work on their personal awareness. I mean, like on anything new. So it's a great skill, in fact. And I would never say that optimism that this is something good. I mean, like positive. We are not blind. We shouldn't be like blind leaders, right? So right. we have that. We know how to work on that. But still, it's a great new future that we got to build. Mm -hmm. New company is going to be created. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Anya, what's your parting message? So tonight? Yes, I do love what um, uh, the director of London School of Economics said. Maybe you have heard. He said that in the past, jobs were about muscles. Now, they are about brains. And in the future, they will be about the heart. That's the reason, you know, the global education also helps students to understand that they have to keep the balance because we have to shape um, a better short future, right? So this is so much needed. And now I would like to also invite everyone, students, teenagers, okay, age 14 plus, who love global education, who love interaction, who understand that nature matters as well, because look what happened during the lockdown, okay? Only nature could save us, right? So that is so important. So on the 20th of um, uh, June, we are going to organize um, the, the webinar one day webinar, it's called Strengthening Academic Engagement um, uh, Program. Uh, you will have a pleasure to, to participate in a workshop because everyone has enough of talking heads. And also <laughs> what I do like in this program that we have an honor to organize uh, is, is the program that's called uh, Instant uh, uh, Motivation American Program. And uh, students can learn how to do the things because parents sometimes complain how to push my my kids into the proper direction. So this is important, yeah. you know, to, to show them how to uh, how to find out why you are doing certain things, why you are not doing certain things. Okay, so um, I think that was also the, the perfect time to redefine your education and your goals. Thank All right. You. I'm not sure. I, I lost you for a second. I'm not sure if you lost me, but I was yes, trying to communicate. I was trying to communicate with you, sort of um, helplessly. But finally, we're back together. Just to bid everyone farewell. Thank you very much. Unless somebody would like to add something at the very, very end. Okay. 
So there's a lot. It seems to to me that there's a lot to be done uh, to get prepared for the future, which uh, of course sounds and is exciting, but at the same time it is, and it follows from what you said as well, quite challenging. We'll keep track on that and we'll probably come back to this kind of discussion, not once, nor twice, more than that. So thank you uh, very much for today. Again, Amy Steinman, Alison Daly, Don Allen, Anna Krzemińska, Kaczyńska and Alina Deja Grygierczyk. Thanks very much for today thank and a very you. good evening. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Job. Thank you.